This is Cynthia DiLorenzi, and I am the CEO and founder of Success in the City. And as you're probably very familiar now with our CEO Chick Chat series, we bring this program to you taped live before an audience at Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw in Washington, D.C. So we extend a great deal of gratitude and appreciate to them for their supporting this important conversation that we have with women business leaders from Washington, D.C. and around the world. We learn a great deal as we begin these conversations. It's the story behind the story. And today we have an incredible guest. She's an author, she's a businesswoman, she's a business leader, she's an influencer. She drives a lot of work and volunteer work here in Washington, D.C. So I know you're gonna enjoy this conversation today. So grab a cup of coffee if you're watching this video and join us, I think you're going to learn a great deal. Our guest today is Tammy Darvish and she is the president of, I know you're, you've got like 36, Right. auto locations. Some um, of them were presidents. Some Okay, so sometimes she's president, company. sometimes she's uh, a daughter. A vice president. Vice president of Dark Cars, and it's a woman-led and family-owned company that deals in the automotive, but it doesn't stop there. She's also an author of a book, Outraged. She's a strong proponent of speaking up when business is going bad, so I think you're going to enjoy our conversation today. So grab your coffee and join us. Tammy, thank you for agreeing to join us this morning. I know you're very very busy and I know that we had to kind of negotiate some stuff to, to get the time that would work so and I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. So what I love about your story which is a lot like some of the stories we talk to it's never what we think it is. We always assume that we know somebody's story that you're born into an incredible family, you're born into great luxury, it was yeah. very easy, you didn't have to do anything and you really just spend the time getting pedicures and manicures and you're just a figurehead, is that right? Very close. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I get manicures. Uh, I do get manicures. Okay. But I do them at the mall where you can just show up, pay $12, and get in and out with no appointment. And it all looks the same anyway. Right, right, right. So right. I, like, I like the way you think. Yeah. Actually, so your father and your parents, and I always mm -hmm. think it's important to understand, especially when you live in America, how did we end up here? You right. know, it's how did you get in Washington, D.C.? How did you end up? And so your parents, your father is Iranian. Yes. And your mother is Italian? Yes. Mm -hmm. So now my family, because my last name's DiLorenzi and I'm Italian, I always say, you know, who lets, and we were German and Italian, and that seemed wrong. I mean, yeah. you just think about Germans and Italians. I mean, who thought that was a good idea? Because you got this and this, you know, is right. that what it is? But you got this from both sides. Yes, we do. I mean, you know, I'd say it was, it's a, uh, you have different cultures. You have extremely opposite religious views. You have, uh, you know, different values. Um, but both, having immigrated, you know, we're both in pursuit of the same thing, and that was freedom and the American dream. As all of us were somewhere along the line. So both your both your parents were direct immigrants yes. to America. That's really how did they meet? Um, my mom worked in a doctor's office, and I think my father used to go there and. That's so did know. they both immigrate to Washington, D.C., or where did they where did they come to? Well, my mother came, uh, was in Michigan, and I'm not really quite sure how she ended up in D.C., but she was there, and that's where they met. And fascinating, yeah. fascinating. So what did your dad do when they met? Was he in the automotive industry? He was. Um, my father, when he immigrated here, came for medical school. Uh, he went to medical school in Chapel Hill to be a doctor, and he was doing his in summer internship. And one summer, um, he had a couple of months off in between school and internship, uh, working in the hospital. And one of his friends was coming to Washington. It wasn't like you could go back to the Middle East for you know a few weeks. So one of his friends was coming to Washington to sell used cars uh, for to make some money. And that's what my father did, and he never went back. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's you, you kind of wonder, you know what? Yeah. You know, so was he thinking about going to medicine because it was expected of him, or do you, and then he discovered this passion he had? What do you think that was? Well, I think in our culture, uh, in the Middle Eastern culture, you're either a doctor, you're a lawyer, or basically we're, you're a loser, you know? I mean, we want to be everybody to be a doctor or a lawyer. So to, be able to have to call back home and say, I'm leaving medical field and medical school, and I'm not going to quite finish it because I want to be a used car salesman, <laughs> was, you know, was frightening. Well, yeah. I think for an Amer yeah, I think third generation families in America would probably go, you know, right. his child called and said, "Hey, I want to be a used car salesman." Right, right. But he obviously found something he was really good at. He did. He, he, he very passionate. That's like anything. If you're really passionate about it, and you're you're gonna break every barrier and pound every pavement that you have to 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 really be the best at it. 
Right. I, I agree with you. I think passion is one of the greatest secrets yeah. to success in work. If you bring that, you'll never work a day in your life. And it will sustain you on the hard days. So I think passion is a key component of that. Yeah, I agree. It was funny. Somebody wrote something on my Facebook page last night. I had posted an, uh, an article that I, I had written. And uh, he said, you sound angry. And I said, don't mistake anger for passion. When you're passionate about something, you could talk for hours about it. You know, you don't even have to write a speech or you don't have to practice. You don't have to memorize. You don't have to read a cue card. Well, they don't have cue cards anymore. Uh, but you don't have to read the prompt television prompters or anything. When you're speaking about something that, that comes from really deep in here somewhere, then it's just it's so easy. That is so true. I, I think, cause you, and I think that's a great point. And I think especially in light of where we are today, yeah. A lot of times when we see things or hear things, we've had a very contentious election cycle. It's gone on for a very long time. And I think that that's a good point. Sometimes we confuse what people are saying between passion and anger. Right. And I think that that's a great, great point. Now, I know that you were not raised here. Your parents divorced when you were relatively, relatively young. So at the time, you have a twin sister. So I how do. many children were born from your parents' marriage? Just, I have a twin sister. Okay, the, so the two of you, a twin. And right. are, you're, you're, not, you're not identical. Are you identical? We are identical. Identical right. twins. But you dress a little bit differently, so it's kind of hard to Yes, very differently, tell. yes. And your sister works in the banking industry. She does. And she's really smart. She's smarter than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's probably pretty equal, because I know the both of you. Um, so you t how old were you when your parents divorced? We were four, and my mother um, took a transfer to Chicago. Um, really for the distance and to kind of get away. So we moved to, to Chicago. So I really grew up in Chicago and didn't come back to Washington until after high school. Really? So did you see your father during that time very much? Or? Um, you know, I th we were able to come at Christmas for a week, and mm -hmm. we could come in the summer for two weeks. And um, we would rotate Easter mm -hmm. uh, every other year. But that was it. Yeah. So, so it wasn't like you were brought up in extraordinarily wealth and great comfort. Your mom really had to... Yeah. to struggle and keep things going. How do you think that impacted you today, moving to, and at four, I imagine you have some memories of this. Yes. You know, beginning to have memories that, you know, mommy and daddy are together. How did that impact you and shape you for where you are today? Well, you know, as far as my parents not being together, I don't really remember them being together, so I didn't, you know, when you, you have that otherness, like a fish really doesn't know what it's like to be out of water because he's never out of water. So for me, it was, that's just the way it is. You know, but um, you know, my mother was very strong-willed, and she moved to Chicago, and she did it on her own, and she wanted, she took nothing, um, didn't want anything, didn't want any support, didn't want, uh, took no alimony or anything, and just kind of wanted to do it on her own. So, I mean, yeah, it was a struggle. Um, you know, just like any kid, you may not have some things sometimes that other kids have, or but, you know, we found ways, and we were happy, and. Um, you know, if you come by my house I, uh, at Christmas time, for example, I have more lights for Christmas, the holidays, than um, probably my whole neighborhood. And I'm sure my homeowners association <laughs> is not is disturbed by it. <laughs> but you know, when we live in Chicago and we have any money, that was like a big thing for us at the holiday season. You drive around the neighborhood and you would look at all of the decorations and the lights and that was a great source of joy you know for us so I do it now and I tell everybody about it because I want people to come and you know kids come in the middle of the night and they steal your little animals that light up and this and that and I'm okay with that because um, and sometimes my husband hears them and he's like oh they're here let's go get them I'm like no 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 sometimes you gotta let these kids think like they get away with something yeah, yeah. and you know but it's a it's such a great sense of joy so I thought oh I'm gonna do that because now I can do it and and uh, I can put them all everywhere, and I can do all the trees, and I can do every inch of the place so that when people drive by, and I think even my my neighbors that don't celebrate Christmas really enjoy it even, and they come, and in fact, they come and ask, when are the lights going to go on, or when are the lights going to go up? And I actually moved from one side of my neighborhood to the other side two Christmases ago, and they were confused. And, <laughs> but I say that, you know, I mean, you know, we couldn't even go on field trips where you pay $5 because we couldn't, you know, we would just call in sick that day. But with that, then I, I'm so creative now in ways that we can give back and get involved with schools and kids and make everybody feel like they belong.
because it wasn't not having those designer jeans and it wasn't not having uh, this makeup or whatever. It was the sense of feeling like you belong. And when a person has that feeling that they belong, they are so much more productive for society. Do you feel today that you belong? I do. You do? I, 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 not only do I feel like I belong, I feel like, um, and maybe a little over the extreme sometimes, that we have a voice. And we are so fortunate to be free to be able to speak that voice and speak our mind. And, and I think um, a lot of people have a difficult time dealing with that. And, you know, if you go over to the Middle East, it's a little bit different there. You fly over there into some of the nations, and when the pilot announces you're in the airspace, you have to cover, you have to clear your magazines of like a women not covered, you have to take your lipstick and your nail polish and no sunglasses and you just, you lose that right and when you do that for the first time, you never ever forget how great it is to live in this country. I mean, this is the greatest country, nation in the world to live in. Amen. And we can either seize that or take it for granted. And um, I don't think, I really, am crazy about making sure that I don't take it for granted ever. I think that is so beautiful and so well articulated mm -hmm. and so important that we say that. Yeah. I think in this country enough people don't say how grateful we should be for the rights we have and that we, are, that we speak up about it That's right. and that we share um, and I respect anybody's right to worship in any way they choose but I also respect anybody's right to be free and I think that if especially for women because I really do believe that Western women will really be the impact for where we go in the future of the world and that we have a responsibility to say something and I think we've been brought up to be very polite and I think it's time that we start speaking up. And you, to me, are the greatest example of that. You don't hesitate. Let me ask you this, when you were growing up, what did you think you wanted to be? And we ask that to a lot of people we view because I think it's an important part of our journey. It's like, what did I think and what were my choices and what did you think you wanted to be? Um, honestly, I wanted to be Erica Kane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's the first time anybody said Erica Kane. And why did you want to be Erica Kane? <laughs> just because I just thought that was a great life. You know, it was glamour. Was it was bold. Nice clothes. It was great people, great opportunities exotic places that you could visit. There were uh, strong, she was a strong businesswoman and very outspoken. And I just, I just thought that would be, you know, when you, it used to be we'd go to the store and my dream always used to be that only tag I want to have to ever look at, that's how you know you've arrived, is the size, you know? I never, you know, can you imagine walking into a store and never having to pay, look at or care about what the price is? All we want to know is does it fit or not, you know? Now the last thing we want to look at is the size. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, but for, for me, it's about, I'm a car salesman. So for me, it's about the deal. And, um, and I'm so glad that there's such a shift in our society right now that it's really cool to be frugal. And it's cool to be hip. You know, it's just cool that we can sit and talk about this weekend, the Kohl's coupon's out, it's 20%, expires at midnight Saturday. We can, you know, do this and we can get that. And um, it's cool. And it's not like, here's my Louis Vuitton bag, here's my uh, whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's just not as important as it may have been at one time. And, and I think that's becoming more and more, you know, visual. So it's about being responsible. And, you know, I look at things in that I can pay $50 for this. But if I'm going to spend $50, I can probably get that for 20 And what can I do with that $30? How much medicine can you buy? How much food can you buy to give to the Capital Area Food Bank? How much impact can you make? You know, for me, I make millions of dollars a year for our communities, for charities. And I do it $20 at a time, or $50 at a time, $100.
Sometimes if I get somebody that's really aggressive, I'll get a thousand dollars. But the more people you get involved in, the easier it, you know it becomes. I I did a 5K on Sunday. I hosted a 5K for Parkinson's, and I invited all of our employees, our associates, to come and everything. And I was trying to teach them that just showing up is important because the more people we have show up, people think it's important. And then if they think it's important, we get more coverage. We get more coverage. We get more funding. We get more funding. We get more testing and medication, and we get closer and closer and closer to solving a, a, a problem. And when you make everybody feel like they have value um, just by showing up, because not everybody can write a check. Writing a check is a small, small part of solving problems in our society, taking action and getting involved. So I had a 29-year-old associate, because I asked him, I was like, how old are you? When he said this to me, he said, you know, I never in my life had the opportunity to volunteer. I didn't know what I could do. I didn't think I, you know, I could help something or someone. You know, take cancer. The only reason why we haven't found a cure for cancer is because we're not committed. I really believe that. I think when we first said we're going to put a man on the moon, people thought that was stupid. It was crazy. How are you going to put a man on the moon? You know, but John F. Kennedy was convinced that we're going to put a man on the moon. We made sure we had the funding. We made sure we had the proper researchers and everything we needed to put a man on the moon. If we want to solve problems, it's got to start with commitment. You know, you are, I think, one of the greatest mm. philanthropists I know. And I had a friend one time say to me, you know you arrived when you can be a philanthropist, when yeah. you can truly be philanthropic. But to your point, I think that a lot of us feel that we can't give and I mentor young women, and it was funny, charity and philanthropy came up in our conversation. And I shared, you don't have to measure, because she felt that her, her giving was down here. I said, philanthropy begins just by the caring. It begins by the kindness. It begins by the act. It begins by showing up. And you have to give yourself credit for caring and doing and being and sharing and talking about something as much as for writing the big check. Because all that's important. But one thing I know about you personally is you will not accept serving in a leadership role in a volunteer capacity unless you have a lot of control. And I want you to share about that because I know this about you personally that you can be invited to the table, you can invite it to be the chairman of the event, but you won't do it unless you say, wait a minute, we're going to make this work the way you believe it should. Can you share a little bit about how you step into that role? Well, it's, you know, first of all, it's, it's always fun to be in charge, right? So, um, but it's not just about being in charge, and sometimes people mistake that. Think about all the boards you sit on, whether it's philanthropic or otherwise. You have a lot of people who do board work that are there so they can say, I'm on the board. But they don't really do anything. I don't even know why they're there. They're there for things like here. You have nice pastries and yogurt and coffee, and they can put on the letterhead, it says here's the board members, and they can put it on a resume or something. For me, I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, that my name is really important to me and my credibility. So if I came to you and asked you for $100 and you gave me $100, how good would you feel knowing that you gave me that $100 and only 20 of it went to the charity? <coughs> so when it comes to the charitable work or the philanthropic boards, I want to be in charge of the money because I want to make sure that we're not buying things, we're getting the deal for things that we have to spend money on. Um, we're getting underwritten as much as possible. If you want flowers for the centerpieces, then let's go find someone to donate them. And then we're going to remind all the people who attend that night that this is not a family reunion or a wedding. You're not just going to take that centerpiece home with you. You're going to pay for it. We're going to auction them or whatever. So we make as much money as possible with it. But then it's most important that we retain as much of every dollar that we bring in as possible. And that's done through creative thinking and collaboration. So for example, um, you know, I have receptionists, take all of our evening receptionists. I don't know what they do, because maybe they get a call every five minutes, but you have to have a receptionist there. So if you have to do a mailer for a thousand mailers, and why would I, I let you spend money to pay a company to stuff envelopes and lick them or whatever. Why don't we just give them to these girls who sit around and answer phones at night or whatever and we get it done for free? Because 
if we're only retaining 50 cents on every dollar, which most charities are in the 20 to 30 percentile, which is a shame, but let's say 50 cents. We raised a dollar, we kept 50 cents, but if I raised a dollar and had no cost, then I keep a dollar. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it becomes a 100% return. If somebody donates flowers and that we normally would have spent $20 on, and then I turn around and sold them for $20, I'm $40. Actually, I'm $60, $80 ahead because that's what I would have had to gross to net that $40, so, or $20 or $40. So I know that with your incredible leadership that you were sought after for this, how do you choose, number one, what organizations you're going to help support, and do you have particular causes that mean a great deal to you? Yeah, I choose um, ones that I kind of feel, you have to really like, you have to look at the people affected by the hunger or the disease or whatever, and it has to kind of almost make you cry. And that's, you know, you have to kind of really be emotional about it. Because if I'm emotional about something, um, I will hit my number. I will find a way to, to make it happen. But if it's just something that, and I think that, you know, that happens a lot. If it's just something that you just don't really, you don't have that tie to or. It doesn't resonate. If it doesn't resonate, right. it's hard to, to be as fully committed. It's like someone else's dog, you know? Yeah. Like, I think my dog is probably the cutest dog in the world. <laughs> and I have neighbors that, I, and I, I'll tell them, I, their dogs are not only a menace, but they're <laughs> ugly, you know, or whatever, right? So you, when you go to buy a dog, you're not gonna get a dog that, I mean, I, I just got my first dog, and I went and interviewed a bunch of dogs. <laughs> and. You know, it's like your baby. When you're changing someone else's baby's diaper, it's kind of gross. Yeah. But when it's your kid, you don't care what they do on you yeah. because you feel that connection, you know, or you, you feel like you're a part of it. So it doesn't bother you. Well, I want to ask you, because I know everybody's curious, how in the world did you end up working in your dad's company? How did you end up working in car sales? Well, you know, when I graduated from high school, um, you know, in when you get to that point in life, your parents can't tell you you can't go because uh, I only have to send you for this long to see your father or vice versa, you know what I mean? So I was exercising my, oh, I'm grounded this weekend? I'm just gonna go to my dad's. <laughs> so um, I came to my father's that summer and once after I graduated high school and he kept saying, you gotta go to college, you have to go to college. And I was like, no, I don't wanna go to college. And um, I stayed with him for the whole summer and then he wanted me to go to Michigan for college. And I thought, you know, that sounds really cool. So you can live in the dorms and you can stay out as late as you want and you don't have to answer to anybody. And you only have to, they send you a check for allowance every week. So, and you can go to classes and meet cool kids. I'm gonna do that, sign me up. <laughs> so I went to school and I studied the automotive marketing curriculum. How'd you pick that? How'd you pick that? Um, that's the college I went to. They had a curriculum and that was specifically why I went there. And I'd never taken an SAT test. So I didn't even, I've, I'd never even applied to go to school. So at this point I was like way behind the eight ball. So my father was able to uh, arrange for me to be able to go there. So I went and um, I wanted to really kind of be close to him because I grew up without him for so long that I thought this would be a great way you know, for me to enter his blended family and kind of feel like uh, I'm gonna contribute back. That's beautiful. That's yeah. So how did you do in school? Um, my first term was a challenge. I had a 1.23 GPA. <laughs> I had two C's, a D, and an F. And I changed them to two A's, a B, and a C. And I sent my report card home. And this was back before they were all digital. Right, yeah, now it's harder to do now. Yeah, you can't, you can't do that now. And um, my, I, my father called me, he's like, hey, I got your report card, great job. He goes, I just don't, there's one thing I don't understand. How does two A's, a B, and a C equal 1.23? <laughs> because um, I forgot to change the GPA at the bottom of the page. So, Oops. <laughs> but um, I had an accident, I got hit by a car and a van, and he ran me over, and I, I was a pedestrian, as a pedestrian, and I broke both my legs. So at that point, I couldn't really, you know, you have someone like me, and now they call us ADD or whatever, mm -hmm. and um, I couldn't do anything because I had two broken legs. You can't go anywhere. And so I just, you know, really started to study, and um, I became really focused on it, and I kind of just decided that 
I didn't want to just be nothing. I want to go make a name for myself. And I ended up getting my four-year degree in two years and graduated with honors and just really never looked back. Is that not a terrific story? So, Is sometimes yeah. something happens yeah. and it changes the path of our life. And we always have to be mindful of that. And I'm sure that everyone in this room can think back to a moment where it seems like some of the greatest disasters in our life turn yeah. out to be one of the greatest gifts. So I want you today to think about those times and maybe appreciate that. It sets you on a different path, but the path you were supposed to be on. Right. Because every one of those that were incidental became this huge, pivotal turning point in your life, which led you to where you are today. And the thousands and thousands of lives that you touch and, and benefit. Mm -hmm. So you graduate. So how did you come to work for your dad? Well, I came back and um, he wanted me to sell cars. And uh, I was like, but, but I, I have a college degree. You want me to sell cars? So I did. He said, you have to sell cars to your sales another month for two months in a row. So I said, okay. So I did that and it took me two months just because I had to fill the tenure requirement as much as the uh, volume. And I'm not surprised. I mean, yeah. I don't think anybody here is surprised that in two months you hit your mark. Yeah, I did that. And then I went and worked in service for a long time. And I, I loved service. And um, I, I've worked in every department, I mean, intimately. Except the, one, the only one I really don't like is accounting. So I, didn't, I don't really like it in there. Ladies all sit in there. They spend an hour in the morning deciding what they're going to have for breakfast, and then they're going to order lunch, and then you know they're just diff they're boring, you know, <laughs> counting money and depositing money. And no offense to anybody who's an you accountant know. here. Yeah, I no mean, because your yeah. work is very important to all of us. But it's hard to understand when you have, you know, I just think ADHD people are extraordinarily creative and brilliant. Yeah. I just think it's very busy that they're that way. I don't know. I'm kind of like that. You know, like, we have conversations all the time. It's like, how do we end up here? But you know, yeah. but I think it's because you're thinking like this all the time. So as soon as you broke out of accounting, you felt like you were free? Yeah, I felt like I was free and I love to be around people. And I, I um, every, you know, in, in, in anything that you do, is particularly in retail, every day is different. Every customer is different. Even if you were my customer three times, each of those transactions or experiences are different. And I like that. I deal with people who come in and can't pay their rent, but they're trying to figure out how to make a car payment. I deal with people who come in and write checks, you know, for $200,000 cars. Um, but for me, I look at it as I can, I can, uh, and I probably get fired for saying this, but I, I am very different um, about women, um, single mothers. I will fight. Uh, we, we negotiate. And people probably don't know this, but we negotiate credit approvals. So banks may turn you down all day long, but when you give them as much business as we do, we can call up the bank and say, look, I need you to approve her. And yeah, I know she's always late, but she pays. She's got kids, she's divorced, she's single. She's got a good job though. We know she's always gonna work and she's gonna need her car to get back and forth to work. And I need you to bring the rate down because her paying an extra $40 a month just because of interest is not productive for her, you know? So I look at customers and I, I can sell that person be, if I understand them. You, you are one of those yeah. people, I think, how many people like going to buy a car in a car dealership? Right. Uh, the audience that's all women? One, you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> you just like driving all yeah, the time. Yeah, you like driving. Yeah. <laughs> how many people absolutely detest that experience? Yeah. I would say 90% of the women here. It's, it's I think buying a car is one of the most intimidating experiences we have yeah. because I don't think we truly understand the process. And you feel like you're being taken advantage of, but you don't know where you're being taken advantage of. Right. So you've really changed that, and you've changed that with your team. How have you done that? Well, you know, it's not just with our team, but it's our industry. And that's why I serve on the boards of our associations and everything because I think it's really important in our industry. We have a pretty bad rap. And when you tell people that people are like, well, what do you do? I'm a car salesman. Um, they just, you know, they're looking. And, you know, I had a reporter take a great offense um, to me a couple weeks ago. I was in Chicago and I was speaking and I was like, look, we do it to ourselves. Look at some of the commercials that some people run. They always have these little girls on there with very little clothing and they're jumping up and down on elephants and come on down, come by now, let me tell you why, and this and that, and the balloons and, you know, Let's, and we have cleaned up our image a lot. We don't really take advantage. We have more regulation on our industry 
than any other industry in the world, except for maybe banking. We have a lot of regulation, but we don't do it just for that. And I'll speak for my organization. You know, we have one company policy. If you wouldn't do that for your mother, then, why, then don't do it to our customers. So when, you're, when you have a decision and you're faced with a crossroad of, you know, do we do this or that, just look at that person and pretend it's your mom sitting there. What would you do if that was your mom? And when you break it down like that, it becomes a lot easier for people to want to do the right thing. You will always have in any business, no matter how great a company could be, um, some people who just don't get it. You know, greed does terrible things to people, not just in a company, in, in a community, in a society, in a, in a state, in a country, in a nation. Imagine where our world would be. We could find world peace, one community at a time, if we could take the greed out of it and, and, and the uh, gross use of power uh, out. We could really have harmony in world I believe that. But we got to do it one person, one neighborhood, one community at a time. Or one leader at a time like you. Well, I think when you begin to share, I truly believe that if you could get 20%, especially the most influential leadership women, that you can drive incredible change. And I think that's yeah. one of the things we have to do is to come to some form or an understanding and agreement that it is through our examples and our leadership that we begin to change things. Because you really changed the conversation. You wrote a book, Outraged. Can you tell us a little bit about that book and what motivated you to write this book and what the outcome has been on this book? Yeah, um, the book I wrote was about, if you remember a couple of years ago, we had a crisis in our industry. Two of our manufacturers went bankrupt. So our administration put together a task force of czars. And the name alone stri strikes me as just negative. But so we put these guys on a team and we said, you go figure out how to save the auto industry. People didn't understand our role in the industry. We have nothing to do with the manufacturing. And what the czars didn't understand was we are not an extension of a manufacturer. We're simply a, a, a distribution outlet. We pay for our own land. We pay for our own buildings. We pay for our employees. We pay for everything in our buildings. We even pay the manufacturers for the cars before they're even finished being built. So we're of no expense to them. But the czars misunderstood that. So what the, they said, and I know because I was actually on the unsecured creditors committee in the Chrysler bankruptcy, they said, you know, Toyota has 1,300 dealerships in the United States. If we could get General Motors and Chrysler down to 1,300 around there, they're going to be just as successful as Toyota. Um, and that, to me, didn't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense to anybody. That's just ignorant. You have to build a car that Americans want to buy and drive if you want to be successful. It has nothing to do with how many sales uh, outlets you have across the country. So they bypassed Congress and forced these privately capitalized, privately owned businesses to shut down. Now, are you getting this? I mean, and I don't think the American people know. No, what's they going don't on. know that. Are you getting this? This is outrageous. Yeah, it is. And uh, now we lost three dealerships, and I won't say I don't care about losing them because I do. We are very fortunate though because we're dark cars. We could move those employees to other dealerships. We could move those cars because uh, these 2,300 dealers across the country were stuck with hundreds of millions of dollars of debt, personal debt. Their homes were cross-collateralized with their mortgages on their businesses and everything. They lost everything. So it was, and then they came back and gifted our businesses to our competitors for free. Uh, 169,651 Americans' jo uh, jobs were jeopardized, direct jobs, that doesn't count all the people we do business with, were jeopardized for absolutely no reason. So I went to Congress, I had a friend, he wrote a thing for me, a one-page bill, went to Congress and everybody laughed and they were like, are you a lobbyist? And I was like, no. I said, but I want this bill passed to help restore the rights of these dealers. So we went to every member. We had over 450 members on the House and Senate who co-sponsored our bill. And uh, lobbyists told me every day from the manufacturers who were fighting it, oh, we eat people like you for lunch, you don't know anything, you're not a lawyer, you're just a car salesman, you don't have any resources. You start to go to people's offices, they're like, who do you represent? And I'm like, who do I represent? 
They're like, yes, you have to be with a committee or an uh, association. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm the Committee to Restore Dealer Rights, CRDR, founder, co-founder, CR. So we just made one up. <laughs> I paid $49. I incorporated us so I could go in and be like, I'm the co-founder and chairman of Committee to Restore Dealer Rights, and I'm here to see Congressman so-and-so or whatever. And it'll never pass the House. It passed the House. It'll never pass the Senate. It passed Senate. The president will never sign it. President Obama signed it um, into law. So unfortunately, it took about eight months. A lot of people lot went bankrupt by then. Totally, they couldn't, they couldn't hang on. How long could you hang on without getting a check for eight months? You know, it's impossible. Do you get the power of what one woman did? It's not one woman, it's, it's one, it's an, it, it was a lot one of people- One woman who speaks up. Who, who can inspire people to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And a lot of people don't believe. We have to start young with kids and get them to believe that some people just accept, man, I'm broke. I'm always going to be broke. I'm always going to live in the ghetto. I'm always never going to have this. I'm never going to have that. I work at Blue High School. I don't know if you've heard of it in I D.C. Have, and um, I go down there all the time. And I mean, I know the kids. And, you know, at first they... Ah. Tell everybody about the high school just so everybody here is on the same page. Tell us about Blue High School and, and what's there and what motivated you to go in and what you're mm -hmm. doing for them. It's a school. It's in Southeast D.C. Um, I, don't, I don't even have to tell you about the school. I'll just tell you that there are five full-time D.C. police officers assigned to the high school every day. To get into the school, you have to, it's like going to through Reagan Airport. You have to go through the metal detectors and everything. And it's a, it's a rough, rough school. My father always is, tells me, don't, you shouldn't go there by yourself. You should always take somebody. I'm like, are you kidding? Those kids love me. They don't even key my car anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, they don't even steal my wheels, you know. <laughs> but that's what people think. But they, they don't, and I, and I say it jokingly, but when they know you're there to help and you're there to contribute and you're there to help um, these kids that maybe 40% graduate in a good year, maybe 50, if I can save one kid, it's worth it. So what we did was, it took me a long time. To, you know, I've been working for them for almost eight years. It took me a long time to understand, because we tell everybody, you can go to college. Everybody can go to college. We can get the money, you can go to college. Some kids just can't. They don't have it in them. They, they won't. But we can give them a skill other than dealing drugs or stealing and hawking and, you know, we can give them a skill that they can make great money. Automobile technicians make great money. If you are average, average technician, makes close to $50,000 a year, what industry can you do that? Great technicians, and I have many of them, that make over $100,000 a year. So what if we build a center there where we can teach these kids how to work on cars? And working on cars is different today. It's not dirty and greasy. Yeah, some of it is. It's all computerized. We literally hook a laptop up to cars now and it scans all the mechanical um, and technical features through the vehicle, and it comes back and tells us, here's the problem, you know, I mean, for, for the most part. So if we can teach them a skill, we can keep them out off the streets till 6 o'clock at night because we run our after-school programs. We have summer programs. We put them in the dealerships all throughout Washington and give them internships and keep them off the street again, and they start to see how to make good money. Marion Barry actually taught me that. Don't laugh. I mean... He's, 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 he's very productive, and he taught me that. We have to get them to understand it is easy if you're committed to make money the right way, and that's what we try to teach them. I think it's such a great lesson for every, everybody. I, I, I would love to have you here for five days. I've got a million uh, questions okay. for you. But so I want to talk to you. You have two children. How old are your children? 17 and 15. 17 and 15. What do you bring, and how do you raise your children? What, it, what is important for you to convey to your kids? Well, you know, for my kids, uh, I think it's, it's really important for me for them to really understand how important it is giving back. And you have to give back so much that they can't live without you. And I believe in karma or whatever you want to call it, but if you give enough, good things will come back to you. My father taught me that. I remember going to him once years ago, complaining one day, oh, this happened today, this happened. The bank did this, this person did that, this manager did this. And he looked at me and he said, you know what your problem is? And I was like, I'm waiting for this big, profound explanation. And he said, you don't give enough. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you just don't give enough. 
and he gave me this big lecture about how you have to give and you know the more you give and the more different avenues you do it with the more things you're exposed to and the more things you really understand so my kids you know from the time they could even understand what a birthday party was they know that if you want to have a birthday party you have to invite the whole class or there's no party um, and that includes financial aid kids or whatever and you invite the whole class and we have parents in my daughter's school that they're not even allowed to invite certain kids to their homes and it's a shame so if you want to have a party you invite the whole class and we're gonna put right big bold on the invitation no gifts but if you really want to bring something we'll take a gift card because we're gonna put together a shopping spree to auction off at the next gala or whatever and this and that so you teach them little ways like that that um, they understand and they get it and uh, I, I think that although my daughter will tell you that um, she's forgotten more than I'll ever know all I do is ruin her life she's, <laughs> um, pretty soon she's not gonna have any friends because of me um, I think every mother's at a teenage daughter has had that conversation at one point <laughs> at the end of the day I know she will always um, start out or try to do the right thing. They're gonna make mistakes, but she'll try to do the right thing and she'll bring others along. She understands how important it is that people think I'm really smart sometimes. I, I do things like take social media. I do things, you know, I, I know you do your own. I, I don't, but we do things, but I'm smart enough to know what I don't know and to surround myself with people who you can trust that um, are uh, get it and are committed and dedicated and that can carry out dreams so I can dream a lot of things that I'm so fortunate I have the great great people around me all day long that can help these dreams come true or vision of things like hey what I'll bet you know what we can make an extra hundred thousand dollars if we did this instead of that or whatever and you know I did the 5k Sunday that I thought you know what um, it's at Nats Park we're not allowed to sell food there and because I thought we could sell donuts because last year when we had it, everybody was hungry there was no food so what I did was I got someone to donate the donuts and then we took donations from people who wanted donuts <laughs> and so I still made my money but you just have to think creatively and you have to have people who can turn that vision into an act or into an end product I love that I love what you do now you got special plans for Thanksgiving, which we talked about earlier. Mm. I didn't know. So tell us what you're making your children do for Thanksgiving. And you're not making them; you've invited them along. Yes, so I've I would invited them along. A... Right. Um, we're going to go to India. We're going to go to a village called Rishkesh. Um, and uh, Russell Simmons said, you know, he was here speaking for Board of Trade, and he said, you know, there's a difference between being poor and being broke. Broke you can fix. Poor is poor. Our kids don't really understand poor. My kids will tell you they're poverty stricken. But they don't get, people don't understand the difference sometimes between poor and broke. So we're going to go to this little village and we're going to move into this, uh, it looks like an orphanage. And uh, although it's not really an orphanage because they're people who just live in the streets. But um, through an NGO, there's a woman who built a school there to serve 10, 15 kids at least one meal a day. And now she's got it to 600 kids. So we're going to go live there for a week, and that's how we're going to spend Thanksgiving. And um, so watch it on Facebook, and uh, we're, we'll, we'll do our feeds. And I'm bringing in my digital experience uh, expert with me because I want it documented for my kids. But I, I know at the end of the day, they'll never sit down for Thanksgiving meal without really remembering what poor is. Did you tell your digital person who thinks they're going on a glamorous uh, vacation what they're yeah. doing? <laughs> I think, they're not well, staying at the Taj. You know, you, yeah, you don't, yeah, you don't really just show up in India. You yeah, have yeah. to go and get a series of medications and shots and things like that. And he knows it, but he's excited about it. And, you know, I, I think that when you teach people how important giving is and how easy, easy giving is, um, they become inspired and they want to give more and more and more. You know, I, I gave you a dollar once. You still have it. And uh, I, give, I gave dollars to a bunch of people once, and I said, you know, think about it. Half the world's population lives on less than that a day. Half the world's population lives on less than a dollar a day. So it really doesn't take a lot to make a difference, whether it's through talent or... I really think the talent, the time, is far more important than any check anybody can write. So what's the future for Tammy Darvish? 
Where will you be in five years and ten years? Yeah. Well, a lot of people are like, oh, she probably wants to run for office. That's why she shows up for all these. And I don't. Um, I can't pay my bills if I did that. But I think the future is um, um, I'm going to be 50 next year. And when I got 40, uh, I got bolder. And when I get to be 50, then that's going to be, I think, even more bolder in that I just, I'm just i going to worry about how I feel and not the political part of, uh, you know, well, that might upset this one or that one. you got to just do what you think is right. And I'm going to continue to do great things. And I think that um, next year I really want to start the next generation, working with the next generation. Uh, you know, think these kids are so resourceful. They have thousands of friends on Facebook. What if they got all their friends to, to click here and pay $2 each or whatever? Imagine the kind of money that they can make for different charitable groups throughout the communities. And we teach them how to run boards, how to run um, the marketing, or you handle the invitations, and you handle the setup of the party. And this group, you know, get these kids together to do productive and positive things in the communities. It's impacting change. Right. I think you're one of the most dynamic people I know in that way, oh, and I admire and respect you so much. Thank you. I know our audience probably has dying to ask you some questions, and we've kind of gone off a different track, but there were some really key things I wanted to ask you because I think the work you're doing is so important, and that's why I wanted to have you here today. So who would like to ask the first question? I didn't cover it perfectly, did I? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, well, right here. Yes. I want to repeat the question just to make sure we get it on mic. And the question has to do with the work you're doing at Baloo and how that, how well this program was received by the students and bringing in this kind of program and training. How has that been? Well, I know that our completion rate of our program is almost double the graduation rate of this school. Number number one, number two, a lot of kids and will, especially girls, will sign up for our classes because they have to take an elective, they waited to the 11th hour and they end up in there. But what, what, what's good about it is we teach them that in a dealership, we have like nine, 10 different businesses in a car dealership. So we can teach people to be service advisors, um, accountants. You know, we don't need you to have an MBA in finance or accounting to teach you how to be an, a, a accounts payable or accounts receivable or cash, you start as a cashier and then we make movie to accounts receivable and then accounts payable and, and things like that, customer service, um, social media, digital experience, marketing, sales, um, finance, parts. There's so many different <coughs> facets to our business that we're able to teach them and all dealers are invited. It's very unfortunate that you know not many will go or participate or whatever, but we don't care. Because if you brought me today, one thing about our business is if you brought me today 100 technicians, apprentices, I don't even want anybody with, I don't even need experience, I would hire them right now. We cannot fill these positions nationally. Um, we are always hiring, even in the midst of the worst uh, hurricanes, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, recalls, bankruptcies, car dealers are always hiring. And we drive the American economy. So if we can get them to understand and, um, the, all the different things, so you know, turning wrenches might not be for you, but something else might be, then we can get you more engaged, put you in the internships and the dealerships, and we'll hire them. We hire them all. The ones that come to us when they graduate, we'll hire them all. So here's great right there. I mean, we found a path to helping people find work in a recovering you know, economy. And that's high skilled. I mean, right. being able to have the technical expertise, you know, the training is skill. And I think that that's really where we're going and that's exciting to see. Yeah. Pretty soon we're gonna have cars that drive, we already have cars that drive themselves. So, Almost, yes. So they're really gonna have to have high skilled. Who else has mm -hmm. a question? Yes, ma'am.
result that you get from that, beyond the fact that they show up at nine and eight o'clock and turn wrenches, you get exponential results out of that. Could you talk a little bit about that? So the question has to do with how you value your employees and how you, through that valuation or valuing your employees, it's really created huge growth in terms of the commitment within the, did I phrase that properly? <coughs> Good. Yeah, and you know, I think it's in any company or in any uh, work group or even in family uh, unit, when people see that you're walking the talk and you're showing up and you're rolling up your sleeves and you're a part of it, you know, it's like a parent who does drugs. It's very uh, difficult to have children who don't maybe do drugs or something, you know, I mean, because what kind of example are those parents, you know, leading? Um, what we try to do is build stronger kids to overcome that. But um, we, we do events. I love events. And I try to run events. I, I do every month. Last month, we were just, we were so busy, October, between Breast Cancer Month and Parkinson's Awareness. We had so much going on last month. So that if this one is not so much for you, maybe next month we'll be doing something. Maybe that, that might be for you. And we try to get you to come out and bring your family and your kids. Um, and you know your neighbors, your in-laws, your outlaws, whoever you want to bring, so that other people see, and then you feel we know. And Gal will tell you, there's a direct connection between employee engagement and retention and loyalty, as those employees who have a best friend at work. And um, I, we did a mud run a couple months ago, and people thought we, you know. I didn't really disclose to everybody, as I said. I just sort of said it's an 8K, it's easy, it's about five miles, you can get through it, and you know. Um, I don't think they really understood, you know, that you're, you're gonna come out filthy, head to toe, <laughs> full of mud. And I mean, we had guys show up in Prada loafers, and you know, and, um, but uh, we had a lot of tenants, and we had general managers and we had family members there that we ran it. And I gotta tell you, it was the physically the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But um, we had employees wearing cameras, video cameras and stuff, and they had so much fun. When you can get 75 people, and now next year, I'll bet you I have 200. Because now they went and told everybody how much fun it was. And, you gotta, and if you don't wanna run, it's okay. You can work the registration desk. Or you can stand at the end of the, uh, the finish line with the pom-poms and cheer the dark horse people coming through. And there's 7,000 people ran there that day. You would have thought all 7,000 worked for dark horse by the time we were done. You know, because we dress everybody. We make sure we're all there together. We're loud. We're, you know, we're very inclusive. And people had a lot of, lot, a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. We do a walk, we, we do food drive, you know, think, we have 2,000 employees. That's a big, that's a, I'm sorry, I have 2,000 families in Washington that are dependent upon me showing up in my family to, to do what we can to keep those families supported. If you do a food drive and you just ask every employee, I just need you to bring one can of food from your house. Don't even go buy it. Just go to your house, pick one can or one packaged good and bring it in. Everybody has a can of something in their houses. As I always say, you all, when you go home tonight, I want you to go in your cabinets. You will find more than one, but just find one can. You don't even know how it got there. You don't even like it. You didn't buy it. <laughs> we get food that just shows up in our house all the time that we don't even know where it comes from. So if 2,000 cans of food at the end of the day, but then somebody might bring four cases. I encourage man people in management, you need to go to Costco and buy a couple cases. How do you make that kind of money and show up with 50 cents worth of food? You know, so we encourage them to, to bring more. Next thing you know, we have 6,000 pounds of food or five, five 6,000 pounds of food. And it's so easy. And you go to the Capillary Food Bank, they, they think you're, you gave them the, the moon. And they don't understand, we didn't spend a dollar. We just collaborated through the power of collaboration and ins inspiration. Able to I would be proud that. to work for a company you know? that had that attitude. I'd be very proud. I mean, if I could work for any company in the world, yeah. that's the company I'd want to be work for. A company made me feel good about my role, and it's it's partnering with the community. It's not say go give me your money and buy a car and get out of here and come back when you need. It's we're partner. We're serving our community. We're giving back. I'm curious about how your dad feels about your philanthropic approach. I mean. Is he aligned with you? I mean, or does he always like, you know, there's always that one kid you go, I don't know where she came from, but, you know. How does that work in, no. in your family? He's, he's a great source of inspiration, and he, he, that's really where it started. 
Um, when I graduated from college, he had won a trip from General Motors, from Buick to Hawaii. And he said, I'm going to give you a trip to Hawaii. And I was like, really? And um, he said, yes. There's a girl in Gaithersburg. Her name is Kendra Hawthorne. I remember that. This was 30, uh, 28 years, almost 29 years ago. Her name's Kendra Hawthorne. She needs a kidney transplant. The family has no insurance, and we need to raise the money. Take this trip to Hawaii and um, go find a way. we got to raise 50 grand. And I had just come out of college, you know what I was doing, so we sold raffle tickets. And, um, and I called, you know, when you, you know, naivety, you seem, sometimes can accomplish more. I was calling radio stations. That's how I met Joe Theismann today, till today. Anytime I call, we're still really good friends. And I called him, and he was a quarterback back then, and I said, hey, can you do a radio thing with me, a PSA? And then I'd go to the radio stations, and I'd be like, hey, I got Joe Theismann on my little cassette tape recorder. Can you just play this so that people come and buy raffle tickets from us? And, and we made over $50,000, and it was a guy from Chrysler that I sold the raffle ticket to that won the trip. So Buick wanted to know, how the hell do we have a guy from Chrysler at our, <laughs> our dual, you know, um, trip and everything? But, you know, so he's always, always inspiring. And, you know, with him, it's, you, it's always like, but you, sh you could have, should have, you know. So, like, Sunday, you know, he came to our, our walk, and he said, well, how much did you make? And I said, you know, we made about 320 grand. And he's like, well, what did you make last year? And I said, about 310, so we're ahead. And he goes, yeah, but if you did 310 last year, you know, so he always thinks like that. And, and he's, he's constantly monitoring how many people are coming. What, did, what about leukemia lymphoma? How did you, you know, what are you doing with that? You know, you, last year it was 600,000. How are we going to get to a million? You got to focus on a million dollars, Tammy. You're not going to get there unless you focus on it, you know. So it's, it's just funny because he, you take the car salesman and you roll it into, he's really the philanthropist. He's just very shy and very quiet, um, but he, he really is. I'm, I'm, I'm really just the soldier. Wow, I, oh, it's so beautiful. You're a soldier. Yes. I'd like to hi, uh, this is Beth, and I've enjoyed this. Uh, oh, thank you. This interview is fabulous. Thank you. What became of the woman who got the transplant? What happened to the um, woman who got the transplant? Great question. She, she's, she survived. She grew up. She was eight years old at the time. She's, I mean, of course, gone to college, and, and, and she's doing very well, and, you know, we communicate, and, um, you know, you just don't, I, that's how I remember her name. I mean, you just, you just don't, you don't forget. And, you know, listen, there's a very, very fine line, very fine line between those who need help and those that can help. Seriously, you stand right here. Okay. You know, how do you know today? We're here, we have our clothes, they're kind of nice, and tomorrow we're here, you know, we're divorced maybe, our husband left our source of income. So my, my attitude was I'm not going to, I'm going to be the source, you know. Um, there's a very, that line, you don't know it when you're going to be on it. You don't know when you're going to be diagnosed with breast cancer and the, the crazy things that it does. And, you know, my, I lost a young cousin to lymphoma a few years ago. And we were very fortunate that my aunt could be by her side all day long. And we would go to this hospital and they eventually sent her to Seattle to a clinic uh, for a transplant, a non-related transplant. You, know, you can only go to certain places. And I would go there on the weekends. I would fly there on Friday night and take a red eye back on Sundays. And there were all these kids in this ward. And their parents were there maybe once a month because they had to work. They had to pay rent. They had to pay bills. They don't understand that, you know, a lot of companies, they, they just can't afford to pay, you know, people to, and this goes on everywhere, every hospital, go to Children's Hospital, go to the Children's Inn. You know, we were, we were very grateful. Kids would be like, can you bring me a box of Cheerios next week? Can you, you know, because they don't have access. And I really believe, I'm not a doctor and people probably, you know, write bad things that I, oh, she said this. I think that power of positive spirit has so much to do with a recovery of a child who's sick, and if they didn't, if they never ever recover, at least in that time of pain, they're happy, and they have joy because their mother's by their side or whatever. And people are not that fortunate. You know, th we think that we need to raise money to buy medicine. You know, a lot of the money that we raise is for patient services, and that is just as, if not more important, than finding the cure. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I do know that yeah. there are studies which actually indicate that prayer 
and belief and support yeah. from others will really stem and change the tide for everything we're facing. Okay, my last question for you is what does your husband do and what does he think about being married to you? You know, my husband, um, we're out, he's an engineer, so he's very logical, very methodical, and, you know, you can't, you know, engineers are different. You know, you can't just say, okay, well, just, you know what, change gear right now. Instead of going to the grocery store, just run to the dry cleaners because they're going <laughs> to close first and then get, don't worry about the groceries. We'll do it tomorrow or call Peapot or what, you know, he can't think like that. You know, everything has to be well thought out, well planned out, and... You know, we're like five minutes before we're ready to leave. I'm like, oh, you know what? Come to think of it, it's black tie, you know? Because <laughs> um, I never really know, especially when you're out. You know, listen, we could go to dinners every night. We could go to events. So now it's, and we used to, we used to, I mean, that's what women do, right? We can't wear the same thing. So we have to have different, now I have one black dress. So if you see me at one, you're going to see it again. Because you just, you get over, you're over yeah, it. Yeah, you, you do know, get you just, over it. You're yeah. over it. And, um, you know, you just, you, you, we used to think it was great, we're going out, we're eating all the time, and this and that, but, you know, we're there for a reason. And so he, he's always, he's always confused. <laughs> um, I'll say that. He never really knows. I bet you 90% of the yeah. women here's husbands are probably 90% of the time confused. Right. <laughs> he never really knows, like, oh, we're going somewhere tonight, or we have to do this, or whatever, or I'll send him to one event, and I'll go to the other, or we split up, or... I'm like, look, I need you to go, go there um, and just do this, or I, I, I need you to go golf with these people because I said you would and you know, <laughs> or whatever. And, and he, I'm very lucky. I'm, that, that's the bottom line. I'm very, very lucky. He's very tolerant, um, doesn't ever really lose his cool. And I mean, he's, he's always there. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. That sounds like a great match and a great dad. And perpetually confused is a good way to keep him anyway, so I <laughs> don't know what's going on. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, Tammy, you. you've been phenomenal. I think no, you all you. agree. You probably is a lot more thank we you. need to talk about. Thank you've been you wonderful. I can't thank you thank enough. You. Thank you, thank you. So I've got a small gift for you. I would have brought you a thing of canned food had I really known what we're going to be talking about today. Really? But it's a small gift for you. I might keep this. Yeah. You know, if you come to my house, <laughs> and and some of you have been you. there, I, um, I have a re-gift room. And I tell people, please don't buy me anything <laughs> because I'm going to sell it. And, um, <laughs> well, then that's, if you no, do, I will not be offended. Someone gave me a Mont Blanc pen at a thing I went to like two weeks ago. I was in Vegas, and I was so disturbed that they engraved my name on it because <laughs> I was like, but, but, because I use five pens a day because I'm going to lose them. I actually took a Pillsbury pen because I was like, oh, that's good, and you had a red. So I was like, I'm going to get one of those red pens. So thank you. Thank you for the red pen. I'm, I won't. I will. Um, I, I won't. I won't regift this. Well, I it, it would. You. Yeah. Thank if you. it goes to a good cause, yeah. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. You've been wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Actually, this is good to keep in the briefcase. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. I know. And we'll, we always thank need a little makeup action. Thank you. Thank you. And we have coming up. You'll see flyers on the thing. We have actually two of our presenters next week, Christine yeah. and Lori. We're um, going to be having. Um, Power up your protocol, gift giving. We know that in Washington, D.C., giving gifts is probably one of the biggest challenging things. Give too much, you can get in trouble. Don't give enough, you look cheap. How do you make something that's a Now statement? I'm going to be in big trouble because I just <laughs> talked about re-gifting. No, well, <laughs> but, it's, 